Good morning, everybody. Just here to remind you that we're going to get started in about two minutes and that we will be taking communion during service. So make sure that you grab communion off one of the tables in the foyer. You can grab yourself a cup of coffee now and grab yourself a seat and we'll get started in two minutes. Good morning, church. If you guys will join me in standing up, let's worship our God this morning. Let's sing, now the darkness, now the darkness fades into new beginnings as we lift our eyes to a hope beyond. All creation waits with an expectation Declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way, for the risen one is overcome. And for every fear, there's an empty grave, for the risen one is overcome. The silence breaks in the name of Jesus as the heavens cry, let the earth respond. All creation shouts with a voice of triumph to declare the reign of the Lord our God. We will not be moved when the earth gives way. For the risen one is overcome And for every fear There's an empty grave For the risen one is overcome You've overcome Let's declare this He shall reign forever Strongholds now Surrender for the Lord our God has overcome. Who can be against us? Jesus, our defender, he is Lord, and he has overcome. He shall reign forever. Strongholds now surrender for the Lord our God has overcome. Jesus, our defender, he is Lord. And 
Welcome to Macomb Christian Church. My name is Rebecca. I'm the worship minister here. And we just want to welcome you all and thank you for being here this morning or watching with us online. Um, if you are new and visiting with us, then we just want to extend a special welcome and encourage you to stop by that round welcome desk on your way out. There's some people there that would love to get to know you and give you a gift this morning. Um, and if you're watching with us online for the first time, we'd love to get to know you as well. So if you can go to our website, macombcc.org, click on new here, fill that out. We'd love to reach out to you. Um, but this morning, there are a few faces that maybe you haven't seen for a couple weeks. Our Thailand team has made it back this week. We're so excited. Yeah. So if you see them, make sure you give them a hug. Listen to some of the stories they have. I'm sure we'll hear from them in the next couple weeks. Um, but this past week, I was reading this quote by a theologian. Um, he passed away over the week, so people were posting his quotes. And I loved this one. But it said, the truth of the resurrection means that the worst things are not the last things that there is always joy and there is always hope. So let's just continue singing and worshiping with joy in this house of the Lord because there is so much to sing about. There is so much goodness, even when we might see badness or evil, that we know that there is beauty, there is hope because we celebrate a risen Savior. So let's continue worshiping this morning. We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, we shout out your praise. We sing, we sing to the God who we sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung upon that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, oh, oh, we shout out your praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Cause we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. 
with the melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone and I'm no out. I know there's not really lyrics, but I love these O's because it's the thing that I love to sing when there's parts of my heart that I don't have words to. There's an ache in my heart that I don't really have the perfect lyrics or the perfect prayer or the perfect words to sing. This is what I love to sing because it just gets that out of me. It's a way to express yourself to God when maybe there's parts, there's hurts, there's pains, there's there's excitement inside of you that you just don't know how to express. So that's what I want you to put into these O's as we sing these all together with one voice. So let's sing this out. worship you this morning. We thank you that we can declare that we are no longer a slave to our fear, a slave to sin. God, but that we are your children, that we can call ourselves sons and daughters of the most high God. We thank you that you hear us. You hear the ache of our heart, even when we don't have the words to speak or to sing, God, but that you know us, you know the desires of our heart, God, and that you 
give us good things when we ask for them, God. We thank you when we worship you this morning that we can all sing together with joyful hearts and spirits and declare that you are a risen king and that you are good. God, we worship you. We thank you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys may all be seated. Good morning. I'm Beth Van Reenen, and my husband Mark and I have been members at Macomb for a year now, but many of you are thinking, really? I don't know a thing about her. Well, the most important thing you need to know about me is I'm a child of God. And even though I've been a follower of Jesus for decades, I still am confused by some passages of the Bible. And I was talking to Mark on the way to church this morning about that. And he's like, well, of course you don't. You don't know everything. Well, inquiring minds want to know. Um, one scripture that has long confused me is Hebrews 9, 22, that says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. What? What? Why does blood have to be shed for me to have forgiveness? As I pondered this over and over, another verse came to my mind, John 15, 13, where Jesus himself said, no greater love has anyone than this, than to lay down his life for his friends. Well, I had assumed that Jesus was commending sacrificial people, but then I thought, wait, is he talking about himself? If that's the case, then he was giving his followers a hint of the plan that was already in place, that he would lay down his life, that he would shed his blood because of his great love. A few years ago, I read a biography of Dr. Paul Farmer. Uh, he is a co-founder of an organization called Partners in Health uh, that went to the poorest countries in the world and established medical clinics. And the interesting thing about Paul Farmer is that he did not want to be a doctor. He had no interest in it whatsoever. But as a teenager, he was in a clinic waiting for non-urgent care when a young girl brought in who was the victim of a horrible accident and she was bleeding profusely. And as Paul Farmer, the teenager, watched, the doctor was able to stop the bleeding, but still the girl looked totally lifeless. She was so pale that even her lips had no color at all. And Paul thought, it's too late. The doctor can't save her. But then a nurse came in with a bag of blood, and the doctor started a transfusion. And as he watched in wonder, the girl's deathly pale skin took on a rosy hue. The color came back to her lips, and then her eyelids flickered, and she smiled. And at that moment, Paul Farmer knew he wanted to be a doctor because he wanted to do that kind of life-saving miracle. But the physician on scene said, no, Paul, that wasn't a miracle. The saving element was the blood. Well, hearing, reading that story made me understand what Jesus has done for us a lot better. He knew that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So he laid down his life, just like some of you give your blood to save the physical life of someone you don't even know. Before we even knew him, Jesus laid down his life and brought us from spiritual death to full, rich life with peace and joy and eventually a home with him. So as we take communion now, I would like for you to consider these elements and remember that the bread represents his broken body and the red juice wine represents his blood shed for us for our forgiveness.
hope your spirits feel refreshed. And now would you bow with me as I pray? Our Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the plan that you and your son created to bring us from death to life. In the shedding of his blood, Jesus gave us the greatest gifts of all, forgiveness and life with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Amen. Another part of our worship is giving, and I'd like to remind you that we have various ways to give up here on the screen. Um, there are offering boxes in the foyer. Um, you can text to give or snail mail still works. And there is um, also on the website, macombcc.org slash give. We have three announcements today. The first one is the most important one, life groups. Uh, whether you are a member, a non-member, a visitor, brand new, you are invited to join a life group. And they are, in my opinion, the life of this body. Um, they're the hub to the right of the door. You will um, see a, a video about life groups. There will be people there, including myself, ready to recruit you because this is how this church connects to Jesus more fully and to each other. Uh, most groups are small, six, maybe up to 20. Most of them meet weekly, some in homes, some here at the building, some via Zoom. Uh, some of the groups are specifically for families with children. Others are for women only, men only. Uh, we have a new group for uh, people who speak Spanish that we're really excited about. So please consider joining. I'm sure you have questions. So go to the hub. There'll be a brochure there that has all of the groups, when and where they meet and what they're studying and who they're intended for. So please do that today. You can also check it out. I forgot my glasses. Um, MacombCC.org backslash life groups. Okay, second announcement is uh, for the student ministry. Student ministry is seventh through 12th grades, and they are having a bonfire, an end of summer celebration, a fun night to fellowship together. It's uh, day after tomorrow, Tuesday the 23rd at seven from seven, oh, I'm sorry, six, well, six to nine, three hours of fun at the Nugent's. So you can get more information on the website on that, oh dear, or talk to the Nugent's. And our last announcement, uh, we didn't have a slide for, thank you, uh, is that a week from today, we're having our Welcome to Macomb class. This is for anyone who is new or has questions about the church, wants to know what's happening here, how things work here. It will be at 11 o'clock next Sunday in the conference room, which is right through those doors. Um, the teacher, the leader of it, is really excellent. So I hope to see you there. Now, Andy. Okay. Well, I don't need that, but thank you. Uh, yeah, th that wouldn't work to give me that kind of a microphone. I wouldn't know what to do with my hands. So no one would hear me because I'd be talking with the microphone shaking it at you. But um, no, it's good to have you all here today. We're continuing in our study uh, of uh, the letters to the churches in Revelation. And um, we are actually in the last three churches. We're in Revelation chapter 3, the last few churches that Jesus spoke to. Uh, so if you want to get your Bibles, you want to get ready, we're going to be right at the beginning of Revelation chapter 3 in just a moment as we begin to share. Um, one of the things I've become convinced of as we've been walking through this study in Revelation is that, is that God has a deep, deep love for his church. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we're convinced that Jesus loves you and me. I mean, Paul wrote about this. I, it's one of my favorite passages in Romans chapter 8 about how that nothing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, there is nothing you can do that could ever keep you from the love of God. But, but I wonder if we really understand Jesus, if we understand Jesus' deep love for the church. You know, it's no mistake that, that the Bible, that Jesus himself calls the church his bride, as a matter of fact, later in the book of Revelation, if you continue to read through it all the way to the end, you'll see that over and over again, the church is compared to the bride that's showing up for the wedding feast with the bridegroom. 
Um, matter of fact, this final re- you know, this reunion that we all talk about in heaven one day, that when all of this is over and we're all together in heaven, is less a family reunion as it is a wedding reception. When the bride, the church, and the groom, Jesus, finally come together in a formal marriage, a formal partnership where we finally get to live together forever. And this is the imagery the Bible uses of Jesus and the church. Jesus loves the church like a husband loves a wife. He's excited to see her. He's captured by her beauty and her complexity. He's protective of her. He stands between his church and any harm that could come to her. He wants her to have a good reputation. He talks her up in front of others. He sacrifices for her. Because this is what love does with people. Jesus is jealous for his church. He doesn't want the church out there courting any other man or any other religion or any other God. He wants exclusive rights to the attention of the church. He loves the church, even with all of her quirks and all of her flaws, that strange little smile that comes over her face, the things that she laughs at that no one else finds funny. Jesus is in love with his church. He's in love with his bride. So let me say a few things about that. Don't be talking bad about Jesus' bride. Because you'll find out from him very quickly that that is not your place or my place to do. Number two, you can't say that you love Jesus and decide that you don't love his bride. I mean, you can try it. You can say it out loud, but it won't go very far. Uh, Listen, if you came to me and said, Andy, I really, really like you, but I don't care for your wife so much. I'll say this. uh, One, you're stupid. (laughs) She's a lot nicer than I am. Um, But number two, we probably won't hang out. We probably won't have a relationship. Why is that? Um, Because if you're going to be critical of her, you're going to have a fight on your hands for me. Because there's something defensive in a husband when it comes to their wives. And listen, I know her better than anyone. I know her good qualities and I know her flaws. And, um, and she and I, we can talk about the good and the bad. But don't anyone else come up expecting to gang up with me on her. Not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And when we see Jesus is speaking to his church... Jesus is not interested in other people's opinions of the church. He's interested in who she really is. And if there's something to work on, he's going to talk about it. And it's going to come from him. Jesus will speak to his bride, to his church, about the things that need to change. And so as we get into the church of Sardis today, into the fifth church here, Jesus says something to the bride that only he has the right, only he has the place to say. So before we jump on the bandwagon of con- condemning churches that aren't perfect, and let me tell you, um, there's not a perfect church out there. So if we're looking for things to condemn, you can find something in every church that you've ever run across, every church that you find. Realize that there's only one person that a church has to prove themselves to, and that's to Jesus. In the end, there's only one person that the church is marrying, and it's not me and it's not you, it's Jesus. And with that being said, I want to dive into these words that Jesus says to the church at Sardis. But before we do this, let's pray together. Uh, Father, these words are your words. They're the words that you spoke to this church. And so, Father, we're going to trust that you speak to us through these words. Uh, Father, as you talk about your church, Father, may we hear some words that we need to hear. Father, may may we be challenged the way that you challenge them. Father, if there's anything in us that is similar to them, Father, I pray that you will commend it or you will call it out, Father, so that we can become the church that you called us to be. But, Father, more than that, that we can be the people you called us to be individually. Father, may we not just apply these words to a church out there or an imaginary church in our mind, but, Father, these, these words apply to me today. Father, help us to have the, wor- the ears to hear what your spirit is saying to the, to the church. And we pray this now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. John writes the words of Jesus. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. 
I know your deeds. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds, not, I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of God. Remember, therefore, what you've received and heard. Obey it and repent. But if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet, you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. And he who overcomes will, like them, be dressed in white. And I will never blot his name out of the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, Sardis, um, as we walk through this, Sardis was a city that was about 30 miles from Thyatira, the city that we talked to last time. We're kind of working in a backwards crescent all the way through the region of modern-day Turkey right now. Um, it existed at a junction at five major roads. <clears throat> as we read through this, it doesn't seem like the church is facing any opposition from the city or any persecution from the people there. Their troubles seem to have come from within themselves. Sardis was a wealthy city. It sat on the top of a hill. It was well fortified. It seemed impervious to attack uh, for more than 600 years. It, it, isn't it interesting when we use terms like this? 600 years. You realize European people haven't even been on this continent yet for 600 years. For, for 600 years, this city, in, in what they would have considered Asia Minor at the time, Turkey today, had been the envy of the region and commerce and trade. It was an upper-middle-class, upper-class city. The city had little need. The people there were, were relatively wealthy, but they were also very complacent at times. Twice in 600 years, which doesn't seem like a lot, but twice in 600 years, the city had been attacked, and the people in the city didn't even bother to try to defend it. They just went out to their country manors or somewhere else to live while the city was attacked. Um, they seemed to think that the hill or the city walls was enough to save them. In other words, there really wasn't a lot of fight in them toward what was good. It was more like, we have everything we need, we have all that we're, we, we're content, we're complacent. And as Jesus comes to this church, he identifies himself as he who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, now, when he uses imagery like this, we talked about this already, we, we don't want to try to project outward what does this imagery possibly mean. We need to look backwards to see what the Bible says this imagery already says. Now, the seven, the prophet Isaiah talked about the seven spirits of God. And this comes from Isaiah chapter 11, the sevenfold spirit. Um, it, he's prophesying about the coming Messiah. And he talks about how that the Spirit of God would rest on the Messiah, how that he would have in him this sevenfold Spirit of God. Listen to the verse, 11-2, Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord, that's number one, will rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and of power, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. There it is, seven. Seven different aspects of the Spirit of God. And so the description of what Jesus holds in his hands here, the seven spirits of God, refers back to this passage in Isaiah, which if you look at what actually Isaiah prophesied and you compare it to the book of John, chapter 17 through 19, where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, you're going to find an exact overlap, an exact overlap of what the Holy Spirit does within our lives and what the seven spirits of God, what Isaiah said, the seven spirits of God would bring upon mankind, upon the Messiah, that the Messiah would bring. He, um, Jesus talks to us in John about how that he would bring us a counselor, one who would lead us into knowledge and wisdom, who would reveal things to us, that he would come with power to empower us, that it would bring the fear of the Lord upon people, the conviction of the Lord upon people who have sinned, and that the seven spirit of God, I really believe, is describing the work of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is saying, listen, I hold in my hand the, the Holy Spirit, who could be given to you, and the seven stars. And that we talked about back in Revelation chapter 1, that the seven stars really represent the seven churches. And he's saying, listen, I'm, I'm the one who holds the fate of the churches in my hands. They're mine. I hold these churches in my hand. I hold the blessing that the Spirit of God could bring to the church in my hand. These things belong to me. I'm the groom. The church is the bride. Your future's in my hands. And as he talks to the church, he, doesn't, he, he gets right to the heart of it then about what he's talking about. He says, listen, I'm the one who could bring these things. I'm the one who could give you these things. 
but we need to talk. And he says, listen, I know your deeds. He compliments them. You have a reputation for being alive and vibrant. And that seems like a good thing. You would want people to say about that, man, you seem pretty alive. The contrast to that is not very good. You have a reputation for being alive and doing good things that precede you, but Jesus doesn't stay there very long. But you are dead. He says, your deeds, they've not been found complete. You have not completed the works you've been given to do. There's something in you that's lacking. And this is sobering. It says very clearly, it seems good on the outside, but something's wrong on the inside. And of all the churches that we've talked about so far, the, the, this is the fifth that we've talked about, this one rattles me the most. Because Jesus is saying, listen, everything can really look okay, but not be okay. I mean, some of the other churches we've talked about, some of the, the issues they had were, were staggering. I mean, you're accepting bad doctrine, you were, you were following false teachers, you, you were involved in sin, you, you're, you're, your church is full of sexual immorality. There are things that you look at and you go, wow, that's pretty obvious. I'm, Jesus, I get it. Thank you for calling that out in them. But, but in this one, it seems like something, he's calling out something in this church that was much harder to identify, much harder to find. It sounds like things started okay because you don't get a good reputation for doing the wrong things. You get a good reputation for doing the right things, right? But there was something missing out of their spirituality. Their, their faith lacked life. It was dead, not alive. And I spent some time in prayer this week just kind of considering what does it, what does it mean that you could look alive on the outside but actually be dead? Could it mean that they were going through the motions, saying the right things, doing the right things, but their heart just wasn't in it? Could be. Could it mean that something inside of them had just given up, but they were just too stubborn to quit? We all know people like that. We're like, really, they've, they, they gave up a long time ago, but they're just hanging it out to the end because they just don't like to change, or they just are too prideful to admit that something's wrong. Could it mean that they no longer relied on God, but they had kind of leaned into their own strength to do things, that they'd figured out this church thing like we talked a few weeks ago and uh, talked about a few weeks ago where, like, we've got the church thing down, we understand it now, we don't really, we just need to keep this thing moving. And so it looked alive, but something was dead on the inside. Um, the Apostle James gives us another thought about what dead faith could look like when he talks about how that, Faith without works, without actions, is actually dead. That if you say you have faith, but you don't do anything about it, your faith isn't alive, your faith is actually not living. It's dead faith. And it even goes on to talk about, can a dead faith even save you? In other words, even if you say you believe and you do nothing about it, is that faith actually going to do anything for you in the end? Now, now here's the thing that I, I can't honestly say, because... Well, I've studied Jesus most of my life. I don't know exactly what he's referring to here in this church, but there was something. Uh, I guess maybe we have to take a hint at what he was talking about by the recommendations he gives them a little bit later. You see, he says this to them very clearly. You need to wake up. Wake up. There, there's something about what's happening that's not quite right. There's something missing. And then Jesus gives them four very distinct actions to do to combat the fact that they were dead and not alive. Four distinct things. I want to talk about these for a little bit today. He says this, number one, you need to strengthen what remains and is about to die. You need to strengthen what remains and is about to die. That's verse two. In other words, not everything in them was bad. There were some things that they were doing that were good and that they still needed to do, that they needed to invest in those things to strengthen them, those things. And I just remind us, all of us at this, even when we hear about struggling churches, even struggling churches have things going on in them that are good, and we need to invest in those things and invest in those things. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. In other words, don't just give up and say, well, that's the way it's always going to be. you got to wake up and something's got to change. 
And then he goes on and he says this, remember what you received and heard. That's verse 3. Remember what you received and heard. In other words, remember what was originally given to you. I mean, the church was only 30, maybe 40 years old. It wasn't that long ago. Remember that original gospel message, how excited you were to understand it when you first got it, when you first understood who Jesus was and what he did for you and the life he was calling you to live? You remember that? Remember what you received, what you received and heard. Remember what it's like when you, when you first understood that you were forgiven, that you were actually noticed by God, that the God, the creator of the universe, who's created now, what we just passed this last month, 8 billion people on the planet now, um, 8 billion people in this world, and God knows every one of them. Do you understand that he knows you and loves you? Do you understand the significance of that? Do you remember what it means when, you, when, that, when that concept brushed your mind and you finally grasped on the fact that someone that great and big knows me? Remember. Remember the freedom you felt when you realized all that he had done for you and the life that he's given to you and how that it's different than the life that you once had. Remember the thrill you felt. Remember how you wanted everyone to know what had just happened to you. Remember the changes that had happened and this new outlook in life and everything in your life seemed to be different and you could not talk about it. You couldn't not talk about it with people. It, It was on your mind all the time. Everything you saw related back to the thing that Jesus had just done for you. Remember the first things you learned and how good it felt as you began your new life and how those new activity brought your, brought actually your faith to life itself. He says, remember what you received and heard. Remember what you received and heard. Do you understand how good what we've, what we've been given? And then he says, verse 3, obey it. Obey it. Now, now, here's something amazing about this advice. When we actually get to the end of it, we're going to realize this is probably the simplest advice you've ever heard. But sometimes the simplest advice are the things we need to hear. Obey it. The things that you've been told to do, do them. The things that you remember, the th- things you did at first, do them. Uh, pray, serve, learn, worship, gather, encourage, share. Sometimes we forget the transformative power in the basic things that we do as Christians. In our desire to grow and mature, we sometimes want to put aside the basic things that are the building blocks of the things that actually breathe life into our faith. And we want to go on and do different things. But without them, the demonstration of our faith grows shallow. Without these things, we're really trying to live this Christian life without God in it doing things on our own. And so he says at last in verse 3, he says, so repent. Repent. We need to repent of this. Repent that we've outgrown the first actions of our faith because because we've done it in the past and we think, okay, well, I did that, been there, got the T-shirt, can we move on to something new? And the answer is, If you want a faith that's alive, no. The elementary things that we do to know God, to interrelate with him, and to live for him never leave us. Now, repent means to stop the direction that you're headed in right now and to turn a different way. Um, uh, We talked about this before, but repent at one point was an army term that they used in the army when they were marching in rows. And and the term repent meant... um, Simply that you needed to stop marching the direction you were going. You stopped, you turned around 180 degrees, and you marched the other direction. Repent. But the term felt a little too religious, so they replaced that command in the marching orders. You won't hear them yell, repent, anymore. But that's really the root word of what repent meant. You were walking this way. Somebody called out, said, it's time to change. You turned around 180 degrees. You walked the other way. You see, we don't think in terms of repentance anymore when we think of our faith. And I think this is dangerous for us. See, we tend to think of our faith in terms of improvement, not repentance. Let me explain this for a minute. So many of us are on a self-improvement kick and making ourselves better and better. And adding Jesus to our life is just one more way to make our life better. But the problem is, is you can add Jesus to your life and your life may not get better. I know that sounds sacrilegious. Let me tell you why. 
Because without repentance and walking away from an old way of life, what you add in a new way of life will not matter. It may not matter. It may not change anything for you. Now, now let me put this in some um, terms. Uh, oh, some physical terms that might make this make sense for us a little bit better. We all, we all understand health a bit. This is, this is not a health lecture. I have no reason to lecture anyone on what they should be eating or not eating. That, that's not my thing, okay? So if you saw what I'd eat in a week, you'd be appalled. You'd think, this is the guy we listen to every week. Um, I am a junk food junkie. I really am. Um, um, and, but we all know what it, what it should mean to eat healthier f- foods, and we all are aware of the health benefits that that could bring to us. Um, we know that we are aware of what foods are good for us and what foods have very little nutritional value but all the best flavor in the world, right? And if you want to eat healthier, we all know that we should add fruits and vegetables and lean proteins to our diet. But here's the thing. If we just added those healthy foods to our already unhealthy diet, we just end up eating two times the number of calories we already do, and our diet wouldn't be any better. Did you catch that? The change to healthier foods would be negated because we didn't eliminate the unhealthy foods from our diet. And this is the heart of repentance, folks, right here. So many of us just want to add the good things of God to our life and just say, well, that should be enough, right? I'm on a self-improvement plan. The problem is if we don't repent of the things that we're doing that aren't right, we'll never have room for our life and the things that are. And in the end, we'll end up healthier than we were at the beginning. I think James says this as well. I keep referring back to James, but a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. When you try to do two things at the same time, all you end up is confusing yourself and everyone around you. And Jesus is, is looking, I think, at us and saying, listen, repentance in life, you need to admit that you need to change, that the pattern that you're in needs to be different. <clears throat> repentance means we stop doing something and begin doing something new. And Jesus' challenge to the church in Sardis was this. Something needs to change here. You need to repent of something. Now whether that was you need to stop doing things half-heartedly. Or you need to go back to the things that you did when you began your journey with Jesus. Or you need to, consider your, you need to stop considering yourself that you've kind of outgrown these elementary principles of what it means to follow Christ. Or... or you need to start finishing the things that you've, dis- that you've begun to do. That you need to complete the works that you've started. Uh, l- listen, I-, I understand all of these temptations. I think we all do it at a, at a basic level. Um, there are things that when we first came to Christ that drove us to amazing change in our life that today many of us would look back on with a hunger to say, I wish I still felt like that. When I was a young teenager and um, gave my life to Christ and had a youth minister that was working with us in our church, he challenged a few of us, got a, a few of the older boys into a small group and challenged us to, to read through the Bible in 18 months, the, 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 the whole thing, uh, 18 months. And, and I'll be honest, I thought that would be a breeze until I got into Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and some of those books and Isaiah and Jeremiah. Some of those books are not simple to read through, but there were three or four of us doing it together, and we were encouraging each other to kind of keep up. And so for 18 months, we read through the Bible. And I'm going to tell you this, that, that um, I was learning new things every day. I was reading things that I had no idea were in the Bible. Because even a kid growing up in church and doing all church things all of my life, there were parts of the Bible I didn't even knew existed. Song of Solomon was an amazing book when I found it. But anyway, it was... Uh, um, but then I went away at, right after that, um, graduated from high school, went away to college, my freshman year in college, and I had a Bible survey class my freshman year, a two-semester class through the Old Testament and New Testament. And again, the professor didn't challenge us. He required us to read through the entire Bible in eight months. Eight months. That was a lot faster pace. That was a lot more chapters a day. That was about eight chapters a day of reading through the Bible. And I, I can remember as I did this... Um, <clears throat> I was picking up things that I didn't see the first time around, and I was learning things that I'd never seen before. And then I was sitting in class with a professor, <clears throat> and with his help, <clears throat> I was starting to see parts of the Bible and starting to see the way they fit together in ways I had never been able to see before in my life. And literally, that reading those eight chapters a day wasn't a drudgery. It was something that I devoured. Why? Because there was something I was learning that 
that was getting pieced together, like literally in front of my eyes, there was this hunger. But fast forward 30 some odd years since then. And I've read through the Bible more than a few times. I read through my favorite books of the Bible probably more than a dozen times apiece. And it gets really easy to begin to say, well, been there, done that. And to begin to read other things. And even other good things. Um, books about the Bible instead of the Bible itself. Um, books about theology. Books about God. Books about Christian living and Christian history. <clears throat> None of them are bad things. All of those books can be very beneficial. But there's no substitute for the Word of God in our life. I don't need to read other people's opinions about the Word of God. I need the words of God. And we need to begin to see new and deeper things. And every time I read through this book, and especially now, I've slowed my pace down a bit so that I can digest it now even a bit more deeply. I don't set silly goals like trying to do it in eight months or even 18 months anymore. It takes me about two years to get through the Bible each time as I read through it now. Um, because I want to digest the words as I read them. I want to look at them I, because I need these words. And the, David said this. We need these words more than we need bread itself. I need God to speak into my life on a regular basis, not just so that I can teach something, but to teach me personally things. Because when I stop doing it, when I stop doing it, when I stop reading his word, something in my faith begins to die a bit. There will never come a time when those foundational pieces of our faith will go out of style in our life. There will always be a time that we need to complete them. We need to push through them. We need to continue in them. And if you've stopped because you found that somehow doing some of those things don't bring you the same level of excitement or joy they did the first time you did them, repent and go back and do them anyway. Repent and go back and do them anyway. Because you will always need the elementary practices of your faith in your life. Things like prayer. Um, and there, I get it. There are days I feel like, why am I praying the same prayer all over again? Hasn't Jesus heard me say these words already before? And the answer is, I need to say it all over again. Why? Because there's something in me that submits to the will of the mighty Father in heaven every time that I pray. And I need to work at that every day. It's things like service. If you've stopped serving because your life got difficult or it got busy, get back involved in the things that you serve and that you do. Worship. If you stopped reminding yourself to be completely submitted to God, it's time to get back and to worship and to do it all over again. Learning. If you dropped out of discipleship and learning with others, you need to go find a group and get involved with that because that's where discipleship, where actual growth, where learning actually takes place. It, it Listen, I get it. You can pick up your phone and you can read a blog. You can, listen, you can listen to something every day that somebody has something insightful to say. But there's something different about sitting down with a group of people and doing it together. Something amazingly different about doing it together. If you've given up on gathering together, you need to get back in the habit of meeting together with other Christians, encouraging one another, sharing with one another, starting to talk about things all over again, giving to one another. Because our faith... Unlike what our world today says, our faith is not a personal thing. It's not just a personal thing. Our faith is a very public thing. It's something that we live and we share with others. And in this, Jesus brings a warning, and i got to hurry because I'm getting close to the end of my time here, and I'm not close to the end of this passage, so hang on, folks. We're going to go fast now. Um, warning. Jesus says, listen, if you don't wake up, I'm going to come like a thief. I'm going to come ex unexpectedly. And if you've allowed your faith to stay dormant and dead inside of you, you may lose your reward. You may lose your reward. And yet, at the same time Jesus warns them of this, he also says this. He says, listen, but there are some of you who've remained faithful, whose clothes, how did he say it? Whose clothes are not soiled or stained, who've kept their faith pure and their practices whole. 
And he says, those are the, those are those, are, those are those, <laughs> wow, English, hard language. You are the ones who are walking with me, still dressed in white. And he who heeds this warning and repents and returns to where they were at first, verse 5 says, he will be, they will be like those people too, still dressed, or dressed again in white, and walking with him again. And this is the beauty of God's plan for us. Not that we need to be perfect, but we do need to return to him. We need to come back to him. And when we, we come back, we're promised a reward just like the reward of those who remained faithful the whole time. Jesus' blessing to them was this. He said this, to those who are faithful, your name, his or her name, will never be blotted out of the book of life. To those who are faithful, there's this amazing promise of God that you will receive reward, that he knows your name, and your name is safely and stored securely with him. But in this, there's also a warning, and I want us to make sure that we catch this warning. Because you want to believe is not a promise of an eternal reward. There are those who once were believers in Jesus and been faithful to him that allowed their faith to die, and they walked away, they drifted away, they find other things to do, other thoughts to think, other people to gather with, another lifestyle to live. And Jesus would say to them, beware. Beware. You need to retent, repent and return. And so today, let me just finish this up with just uh, this passage. Returning to Jesus is as simple as repentance. And I know it, it's, it's, it's a word we still don't, we're still not used to saying it. Or using it all the time anymore, but uh, John, in one of his Gospels, wrote this about confession and repentance. Listen. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. And if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we don't live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So I want to I be clear on this. There's, there's something in the act of repentance and confession that's needed in the life of the believer. Um, if we claim to be without sin, the Holy Spirit is not mincing words when he says this. Listen, you are self-deceived. If you believe you, are, you, you have no sin, you're self-deceived. And the truth no longer resides in you. But if we confess our sins, and here's the beautiful part. When we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and forgives our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. When we repent of our sins and we do the work of turning around and walking the other way, the transformation of our life is complete. It's complete with God in the act of confession and with us in the act of repentance. And our life actually has the ability to change and be remade new. We always have a place with him if we'll turn back to him. And this is amazing news. And this is amazing news for some of us in the room today. Because I, I know just from talking to people, I know from my own personal experience, there are days that we let the disappointments of life steal away the joy of our faith. Drifting is easy. Drifting from God is easy. Doesn't take any work at all, does it? Doesn't take any work at all to drift. You just have to stop pursuing. And soon you're drifting. And the amazing news for some of us in the room is this, is even if we've started to drift, God wants us back. He doesn't say, oh, well, you failed, out with you. He looks at you and he says, come back, repent, return, come find me. Wake up! Wake up! And this is amazing news for some of you because you have people that you love who have walked away from practicing their faith. And there's nothing more painful in your life when you consider where their life is and where you wish their life was. Something in them has died in their faith. And you drastically want it to see revived and restored. And here's the good news is it's possible. No one's too far gone. You may not know how to get them back I may not know how to get him back, but Jesus wants them back. And Jesus has a way of going after the things that he wants. And this is good news for those of us who have remained faithful, who haven't drifted away, 
Because not only do we have a place or we have a church where Jesus has made room for us, um, but he is excited because we have maintained a place where people can return to when they've walked away from their faith. Because one of the reasons he loves his bride so much is when we open our arms to those, to all of those, regardless of how good or how bad or how awful their life or their choices have made life. And we allow them access to the Father. Because in the end, we all want that reward. We want our name written in the book of life. We want our future secured. We want others wearing the white robe, standing before the throne, declaring their allegiance to the Father with the assembly of elders and angels and seraphs, all singing his praise forever and ever. We love that image of the Bible. We want that for everyone. And because we just don't want to hear our name spoken by Jesus before his Father and the angels. Did you catch that? That was a beautiful thought, wasn't it? We want to hear the names of the people we love and care about spoken by Jesus before his Father and the angels too. This is not a competition to see who gets in. There's not a limited number of access. This is an inclusion to see how many people we can pack in to his throne room. So as we finish, let me just, let me just say this. There are moments we all need a chance to restart. To look at our life and say, something inside me has drifted and I need to get back where I, where I was. I need to get back to where I need to be in my faith. I need to repent and return. And I don't know exactly what that looks like for you. For many of us, it looks like a critical spirit that, that builds within us to the point where we get so critical of everything around us that we give up too. That's how Satan steals so many of us. But maybe inside of us there's something in us that just needs to restart, that we've gotten worn out and we just need something new. And that's the beauty of what God offers us, that even if we've messed this up and we've drifted away, we can come back if we'll just wake up and repent. So I want to take some time this morning. I just want us to bow our heads. I'm going to ask you to stand. This is how you know I'm almost done. You get to stand. And then we're going to pray together, not just for us here today, but for the people that we love that we wish were here too. Uh, Father, today we come before you and we realize this, that there are times that we get this right. And Father, there's nothing more exciting than to be following you wholeheartedly and seeing the, our life come to, our faith come to life. And the people around us, Father, excited about their faith. And Father, there are times when we're in the ick and the struggle of it, Father, because of the things that we've walked through, because of the things we've allowed ourselves to walk through. And, Father, there are moments where we need to look back in our life and say we need something greater than what we're experiencing right now. Because, Father, none of us want a faith that say, well, we, we held on, but we hated it to the end. Father, we want to say that we held on. There was something in that that was passionate and loved you and that pursued you with all of our hearts, Father, all the way to the end. And so, Father, I pray that you renew that spirit within us, a passion to know you. That, Father, as we work through the rest of this this summer, as we talk about repentance so even over the next couple of weeks, Father, in the summer and in this fall, as we talk about what it means to be completely committed to you, Father, may we find and rekindle a faith, Father, that sees you first in all things. And, Father, today I want to pray for the people we know and the people that we love, that Father, that may have given up on this and walked. Father, may we always maintain a place where they can return to to find you. Father, may we remain faithful so that they find a place to find faith again when they look. Father, draw them back to yourself. Father, do something in their life, Father, to cause circumstances that makes them want to reexamine their faith and what it is that they once believed. Father, uh, may they return to you, repent and return to you. And, Father, I pray that we begin to see the evidence in the life of people that we love, Father, as soon as this week. Father, may you move. So, Father, today we put these things in your hands and we pray for your blessing. And, Father, may we be your people. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for being here this week. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We'll see you next Sunday.